Good morning. Good morning and welcome for, uh, to College Church. And we are grateful that uh, whether a visitor or online or whether a member, we're blessed that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Uh, at this time, we would like to remind you, whether visiting or a member in the pews in front of you, you have a Let's Connect card. Um, both members and visitors, if you would take time to fill this out, we'd like to show your attendance and be aware of it. Uh, also at the top left, that digital code there is a QR code, and you can offer your prayer requests there if you'd not like to write it out on this card. Also, uh, at the top of your bulletin, there are QR car codes there. One QR code, a digital uh, thing you can take a picture of, and that will give you the virtual, um, basically the virtual announcements as well. We're saddened to share two sympathies with you this morning, and we're saddened at the pass of Alberta Newsom, mother of Dan Newsom, passed away Friday, July 21st. At this time, the services are pending. We're also saddened at the passing of Harmon Pete Wheeler, husband of Doris Coward Wheeler, passed away Saturday, July 15th. Doris is the aunt of Cynthia Cole and Janine Alexander. Services will be in Norfolk, Virginia. Harmon was in Eddie Clore's shepherding group. We're saddened at those two deaths. We're also grateful that Mike Caldwell is with us this morning. After nine weeks being absent, we've spent many weeks praying for him and wanted to point that out. Miss Sue Caldwell is still in St. Vincent's Rehab down in Sherwood. Uh, you can visit with Mike uh, for updates on her. At this time, if the Westreach mission work would start uh, easing this way, we're going to have a special prayer led by Norm Stone um, to bless them. And then we wanted to remind you, finally, summer Wednesday nights will conclude this Wednesday. This Wednesday, July 26th from 6.30 to 8 p.m., we will be closing out the summer Wednesday night series with an all-church cookout. We plan to gather at Berry Hill Park and enjoy some fellowship, food, the Kona ice truck, and fun with our church family. Don't forget to bring your lawn chair if you plan to attend. This event will take place of our fifth Sunday fellowship for the month of July. Uh, so there will be no meal provided as the uh, fellowship Sunday on Sunday, July 30th. This coming Wednesday will take the place of it. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I'll turn it over to Norm. For about 22 years, College Church has participated in a Zambian-led uh, Westreach uh, program, which teaches the gospel to those in Western Zambia and is a church planting effort. And this is part of our team, um, Mike Caldwell and Jim Adams, Carol Adams, Fanny Amy, uh, John Stone, Rocky Stone, and Aaron uh, Fari. Those who could not be here include Jake Ward, Kaya Beaker, Stuart Farley, Jim Ferry, that's Aaron's dad, Aiden Hayes, Brenna Fuller, Bailey Hess, and uh, Rachel Story, I don't see Rachel, um, and Sydney Reynolds and Hannah Garrett. They're all scattered from Florida to Washington State right now, uh, but they're probably listening to us online. Uh, with the situation with Sue's, Sue Caldwell's health, um, Mike probably will not be going with us, uh, and so we need to be praying for Sue in regards to this. Uh, I've asked for a, a three-generation prayer, and Rocky Stone will lead us with a couple of sentences, and then John uh, Stone, and then Norm will conclude this prayer blessing. We, we leave uh, Saturday, next Saturday. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to go on this trip. Please help us to touch as many lives as possible and to glorify you in everything that we do. Our Father, we continue our prayer this morning, asking you for safe travels as we uh, 
leave the United States and head make our way to Zambia. Help us to be uh, lights in, in the world that we visit, in the villages that we go to. Help us to be examples as we study with those that have never heard your word, as we minister to those that need healing and spend time with the children of Zambia. Let's continue our prayer. Father, we pray your help and blessings on the members of the West Reach 2023 mission team. We thank you for each person who is willing to serve you by serving others. We thank you that you have spoken to their hearts and that they're willing to venture outside of their homes and their neighborhoods and their comfort zones. We pray that you'll keep them strong mentally, physically, and spiritually during this mission trip. We pray for their effectiveness, effectiveness in treating the medical needs of those they serve, in teaching the gospel to those who need to hear it, and the effectiveness of demonstrating the love of Jesus through the work that they do. We pray, Father, that you'll watch over each one of them, protecting them and giving them safety in their travels. And may all that they do glorify your name. In Jesus we pray, amen. Special thanks to God for the way he's blessed us and to each of you and this congregation as a whole for your uh, very, very generous, prayerful and financial support. Continue to pray. Thank you, Richard. Before we um, start our song service, I have an announcement from the elders, but I also want to uh, pay, uh, note that Howard Norton is with us today, and we're glad to have you back with us, Howard. Beginning Sunday, July 30, the College Church will resume our traditional passing of communion el emblems, a practice suspended during the pandemic. Now that the pandemic has ended, the eldership wants to restore the practice for the clear benefits it provides to us as a people of God. A teaching opportunity for our children, allowing them to participate in the contribution, an opportunity for young men to be involved in serving, a more natural time of reflection during communion, and a reduction in cost of communion supplies. The individual communion sets will still be available near the entrances for those who prefer to continue using them. Let's sing together. <laughs> O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. <laughs>
God, we do praise you this morning for how great you are. We pray that we'll take time every day to look at the things that show your faithfulness to us. Whether it's nature, the beautiful stars and planets in the sky at night, or what you've done for us through Christ. We pray those things will lift us up each day to, to give us uh, hope, give us purpose, give us strength. And we praise you for all the wonderful things that you've done for us. And we pray this morning that we'll use this time to reflect, we'll use this time to renew, and as a time to focus on what's really important. Help us to live a spiritful, spirit-filled life, one of love, of joy, of peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We thank you for sending Christ who modeled all of these qualities for us during his time on this earth. And please give us the faith to follow his example and dedicate our lives to living like him. We thank you so much for your grace, for being so forgiving. Please forgive us and help us to freely forgive others and show them grace like you show to us. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord uh, bless this reading of his word. This is uh, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and, and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace.
The Gospel of John has a, has a detailed account of the teaching of Jesus when he was having the meal uh, before the Feast of Passover with his disciples uh, in the upper room. It was during this time that he instituted the significance of the bread and the cup in relationship to his broken body and the blood that was shed on the cross. One passage of significance in this book is chapter 15, uh, verse 12, I think is important to us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Certainly as we look at this, the passage that I really wanted to key in on is verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone will lay down his life for his friends. Certainly our way of expressing to Jesus our appreciation for that love he showed by laying down his life is something that may be even hard for us to imagine how to do, but a part of what we are doing now in remembering his body and his broken body on the cross is a way of showing that love back to him. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have been asked by other friends, of, well, why do you all take communion every Sunday? You just loses its significance when you do it every week. I don't know about you, but every day I tell my wife I love her. And you know what? She doesn't get tired. In fact, she thinks something's wrong if I don't. And do the same with children and grandchildren and close friends and nieces and nephews and others that are close to you. You tell them you love them and you do it regularly. I think that as we go about our day, we have to remember Jesus laid down his life for us. How do we express that back to him? When does it grow old, too old to express our love to him for this sacrifice? In Matthew, in still the setting in the upper room, Jesus said, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us hope through Jesus. And as we partake of this bread, may we remember that sacrifice and that broken body on the cross. And it's in his name we pray, amen. to his disciples, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Father, we now, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we think of that blood that Jesus shed, and may we express our love in this process by thinking of the sacrifice he made that we could have eternal life. It's in his name we pray, amen. There are many ways to give. Uh, 
and some is, of it is not monetary, and some is, but you can see on the board the many ways that we give. Paul in 2 Corinthians had this to say, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray again. Father, we are thankful for all that you provide for us and for the sacrifice you've made. Guide us, Father, in giving cheerfully, and may we give as we have been prospered. And thank you for the hope we have through your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for our next song as we release the children to children's worship. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. visitors already and uh, several guests, some as far away as Australia. So for whatever reason you're here, however far away you came to be here, thank you for being a part of this service and helping us to worship God this morning. Our God is great. He is faithful. I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think I might have actually witnessed a, a piece of his faithfulness this week. On Monday of this week, I went into Casey's down on the end of Race Avenue to uh, fill up with gas. And I'd already put the 
the, the spout in the, in the tank, and I was pumping my gas, and a woman came up right behind me and kind of uh, at an angle parked right behind my back bumper. She had her window rolled down, and she just uh, pleaded with me, could you put one gallon gas in my car so I can go to my sister's house? I said, well, I'm already pumping gas. I don't have any cash. But I said, I, t I do have change. I have a box behind my, the driver's seat, and I keep a fair amount of change. I said, I have some change. And so I get in the back seat, and I'm getting some quarters, and I come to about $3.50 in, in quarters, and I thought, that'll buy her a, a gallon of gas. I thought, well, I won't stop there. So I kept going, and, and, and finally, I had $7 in quarters to give her. And I walked over to her car, and she, had, she cupped her hands, and I poured $7 in quarters right into her, her fist. And then she put it in drive, and I thought she was going over to a pump to start pumping gas, but she pulled right out of Casey's, and the last time I saw her, she was going down Race Avenue. <laughs> and I will admit, I was a little miffed. But I told myself, you know, God is faithful, and he makes a promise to us that anything we give, whether we give to him or someone in need, he promises that he will give in return, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will pour it into our laps. And so I, I just, you know, kind of consoled myself with that. Well, I left Casey's, and I went to Walmart. And I went back to the records and CDs and music section. I have a turntable. I, I love still listening to vinyl records. In fact, some of you know I have a turntable in my office. So I listen to records quite a bit even today. And I thought my grandson number one uh, loves Disney music, L listens to it all the time. And so I thought, well, I will, I'll get some of these records, and I'll take one of these suitcase portable record players next time I go to their house. And, and I thought he might like interacting with his music the way we did back in 19 None Your Business. And, <laughs> and so I've got Lion King on vinyl and some others. And, and so I went to Walmart to see if I could find another vinyl record, a Disney record, and I found Aladdin. And it was $26.00. They're expensive these days. So I found Aladdin, but when I took it to the register area, the self-checkout, I, I scanned it, and it scanned $10. And so I called a lady over. I said, this isn't scanning up right. It's, it's only showing $10. Well, she pulls out this little gadget, and she scans it herself, and, and, and she says, it rings up $10. And she showed me, said, if you purchase it in store, it said, in store only. I said, well, I'm not going to talk you out of it if I don't have to. And so, and, and we even double-checked to make sure that the numbers on the, on the uh, price tag, as well as the receipt, that they, that they matched up, and they did. So I bought a $26 album for $10. And I thought, God is faithful. <laughs> he gave me that $7 Good measure, pressed down, shaken. Now, was that God? I don't, I don't know if it just, you know, Walmart just doesn't care about making money anymore. I don't know. But I do know that God continues to bless me far more than I ever give to him or give to others. He is a faithful God. We continue our study in summer fruit this, um, this morning. And we are looking at the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we're to the point we're looking at faithfulness and gentleness this morning. Lord willing, we will look at self-control. I have no self-control on that one. We're going to do the whole sermon on that one. We're not going to split that one. But you know, as we seek to grow in the fruit of God's Spirit... We need to remember that the command there is to walk according to the Spirit, not to live by the desires or those deeds of the flesh. We need to walk by the Spirit. But understand this. They are opposed to each other. If you're in Galatians 5, look at verses 16 and 17. This idea of, of walking by the desires of our flesh and walking by the Spirit, they are in contention with each other. They are diametrically opposed to one another. The desires of our humanness, our flesh, 
is going to retaliate against the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The, the more that we try to walk by the Spirit, the more our humanity and the more our flesh is going to try to fight against God taking control of our lives. And the desires of the flesh are going to resist every attempt that we make to nurture the fruit to grow the fruit of the Spirit and to develop it in our lives. It's going to resist becoming what God calls us to be. It's going to resist it as much as can. So we, that's why we, this is a daily thing that we have to try to nurture and grow the fruit of His Spirit in our lives. Because the desires of the flesh are going to aggressively work to regain control of our lives. Just because we become a Christian and we receive that wonderful, precious gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and God wants to develop the fruit of the Spirit, don't think that there'll ever come a day that your flesh just says, okay, I give up. All right, God, you just take control. We have to make a daily decision every day who's going to have control of our life. You see, it's your choice. You have to decide. Even today, we're in church. Even in church, you have to make the decision and the choice. Am I going to let me, am I going to let my desires, am I going to let my flesh control the way I talk to people, treat people, the way I go about what I do every day? Or am I going to give control over to the Holy Spirit of God who wants my life to exhibit qualities like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? It's a choice. But following the flesh will never lead to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. The only thing that will bring about those good blessings in your life, the only way that you'll be able to truly bless the lives of people around you is if God has control and the fruit of the Spirit is growing and excelling in your life. And so this morning, the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Now, faith is what we believe. Faithfulness is how we go about living what we believe, what we believe about God and what we believe about His Son, Christ Jesus, and the Word of God and the, and the church of God. All the things that we believe, faithfulness, how do we live what we believe in our lives? Faithfulness is obedience to God and His Word, living like a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ, using Him as our example, how we walk in this world. And faithfulness is refusing to let the world shape us and mold us to become what the world wants us to be. Faithfulness is allowing God to mold you, to allow the Holy Spirit to mature you and grow character in you. Faithfulness is loyalty. Faithfulness is loyalty and dependability. It's becoming the kind of person that God can count on. That God knows that even when everyone else is doing what is wrong, even when everyone else is going this way, He can depend on you to follow His will and to do the right thing. Now, there were times in the Old Testament that the children of Israel weren't so loyal. They weren't as dependable as they needed to be. Oh, they worshiped God because they came to a point in their history where they actually thought that, well, all we have to do is go through the perfunctory motions and rituals of worship and bring God the sacrifices in the right way, at the right time, on the right day, that if we do all of the rituals of religion, well, that'll make God happy, and he'll just keep blessing us. But God wanted more than just sacrifices. It's in Hosea chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 6 and verse 4. In the New American Standard, I like how it reads here. In the New Americans there, it says, What shall I do with you, Ephraim? Ephraim was also, you know, they were the largest of of the tribe. So oftentimes, when God was referring to all of Israel, he might just call them Ephraim. And so he's referring to all of Israel. What am I going to do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah, for your loyalty? Now, the ESV says your love. The NIV says your goodness. Your loyalty to me. Your love for me, the goodness that you show to me is like the morning cloud and like the dew which goes away, kind of like James says, that mist. You got that morning dew, it goes away so quickly. God says, at one moment I I look and I, I see my people and you are loyal. 
I can tell you love me, but then I turn around twice and, and it's gone. You're gone. You're not there. Where's the loyalty? I thought I could depend on you. Verse 6, for I delight in loyalty. The ESV says steadfast love. Love that I can count on rather than your sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I could go to a number of passages where God talks about, I don't desire sacrifices as much as I desire mercy. I don't desire all of the many burnt sacrifices. Did God command it? Yes, he did. But that's not ultimately what he wanted most from his people. He wanted to know he could count on them. And he could depend on their loyalty and their love, their steadfast love. And it wasn't just enough that they come and go through the rituals of worship any more than it is for us to come and, and, and go through the perfunctory rituals of, of singing and bowing our head and open up the scriptures. And what God really desires for us this morning is not just our attendance in worship. He desires that our hearts be faithful to him. That not just on Sunday, but tomorrow you will be just as faithful. He can count on you. He can depend on you to do the right thing. Our faithfulness is what matters most to God. You know, you can go to Hebrews chapter 11, that great chapter on the, the great uh, heroes of faith, the hall of faith. I've always said for a long time, though, if I had been given editorial privilege... When writing Hebrews chapter 11, I would, have lived, I, would have lived, uh, I would leave a number of those names out. I would have left a good number of them out. Because they weren't perfect. See, we're not talking about perfect, perfect people. We're not talking about sinless perfection. We're talking about faithful people. Every one of the names in Hebrews chapter 11, they all had faults. They all had their blunders. They, they all had reason to be left out of Hebrews chapter 11. But God put them in there. He kept them in there because they lived and they died faithful. They weren't perfect, but they were faithful. And they loved God. And even when they made mistakes, that didn't change how they felt about God. And they trusted God and they tried to walk in obedience to Him. Just like Job. You know, when we talk about the, the life of Job, you know, it's God who brings up Job to Satan when he says, ah, hey, old devil, have you ever considered my servant Job? God brought up the subject. Hey, he's, he's a good man. There's none like him on earth. He, he shuns evil. Have you considered him? And even Job would, would not claim perfection. But God knew, even if you took everything away from Job, you took his family away, his health away, his wealth away, God knew he could count on Job to be faithful. And so faithfulness is, is being dependable. Let's take an exam. Let's see if God can count on you and me very quickly. Can God count on you, and I'm talking to myself right now, to do what is right in his eyes. Even if everyone else around you is going the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing, can God count on you to do the right thing? To keep yourself sexually pure and holy? To, to do the right thing when the whole, all the world says, oh, that's, that's, that's old stuff. Can God count on you? Can God count on you not to forsake these times of worship and Bible study and can God count on you to be involved in this church, making a difference in the world, helping this church to fulfill its calling, to, to go out and, and save souls? I mean, is, is, are you just a, a person that just comes to church, you go through the perfunctory rituals of, of church, but nothing more than that? Or could God count on you to help this church grow and to share the gospel? Can God count on you to give faithfully and generously as you have been prospered. And look at our parking lot. We've been prospered. There's an old story, an old preacher story probably, but an old story about an elderly woman that was at church and she fell on Sunday morning in church and hit her head on the floor. And I mean, she's knocked out cold. She hit her head hard. 
And so they called the ambulance. The people rallied around her. The ambulance is called. They put her on the stretcher, on the gurney. And, and about that time that they're about to take her out of the building, she comes to. And in a very, very weak voice, she motions for her daughter to come in close to her so she can be heard. And her daughter leans in and listens very carefully. And everyone thinks that these possibly could be the very last words that this elderly woman is about to speak. And her daughter leans in and the lady says, My check is in my purse. Make sure it gets put in the plate. That's faithfulness. That is making sure that nothing comes in between you and your God. He can always count on you. Can he count on you to keep your word? To keep your promises? You know, we live in a world where if you've signed a contract, don't worry about that. Just go do what you want to do when you want to do it. We live in a world where a good old handshake isn't a man's word anymore. We live in a world where even marriage vows mean very little if circumstances change. But God ought to be able to count on those who are filled with His Spirit, who are trying to grow the fruit of faithfulness in their life to keep our word and to be faithful. And can He count on us to finish the Christian race? As Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Faithfulness is finishing what we begin. doesn't mean you have to do things better than anyone, that you don't have to run faster, and you don't have to get to, to the, the gates of heaven before anyone else. It Finish the race. Vic- victory in the Christian race comes from finishing, not necessarily being first. That's faithfulness. And the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Gentleness is caring about other people's feelings. Even when we don't agree with them. Even when they are not always living the way we would want them to live. Caring for them, being gentle toward them means that I know what would hurt my feelings. I know what would offend and insult me. And so it goes back to the golden rule. To treat other people the way we want to be treated. And so gentleness means that I care about you. And I know what would hurt and offend me. And so I don't do those things to you. I'm going to be gentle towards you. In our scripture reading a few moments ago, in that uh, section about unity in the body of Christ, in verse 2 of Ephesians 4, with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. Did you notice that three of the nine fruit of the Spirit are in that one verse alone? Which tells me that the unity of this body here, the the fellowship and the harmony of this body, has a lot to do with you being filled with the fruit of the Spirit and I being filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And we make those priorities in our life. But we also see it in Paul's words to the young evangelist Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 24 and 25. When he's talking about Timothy as a, as a leader in the church, but he calls him a servant. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, yes, patiently enduring evil, and correcting his opponents, with gentleness it takes gentleness to give some constructive criticism in the right way on a uh, very very rare Sunday I will make a mistake why is that funny because you know it's a lie (laughs) probably I make my share of mistakes I always have and, and hopefully, part of, part of my, uh, uh, my confidence comes from, I don't, take, I don't take myself all that seriously. I take what I do very seriously, but I don't take myself very seriously. I make my share of mistakes. I mean, I mispronounce biblical names. How many of you remember on a Sunday night when I mispronounce uh, Elimelech, Elimelech? <laughs> you would, 
The way people hounded me after that service, you would have thought I called uh, Elimelech Ellie Mae Clampett. I mean, you, you just thought I just butchered that terrible. Well, I've mispronounced names. And, and I've gotten, uh, mis- yes, I did that on purpose in case you're wondering. But, but sometimes I'll have, uh, Deanna Brooks uh, shared with me last week that I, I, in my PowerPoint it said Hebrews chapter, I was quoting Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2, but it said Hebrews chapter 13 verses 214. So I just had too many numbers and all. And that's kind of, that's not a rare occasion with me. And, and Deanna Brooks has, has carte blanche to correct anything on my PowerPoints, and she's done it often. <laughs> in fact, do you know how hard it is to slip a mistake by a church like this? It is nigh unto impossible. I mean, we have people with PhDs in, in English and grammar and history and math and Greek. And they carry Greek Bibles with them. I don't know if they can read it, but they have Greek Bibles with them. It's, it's kind of tough to get a mistake by a, a church that has all these PhDs when I have been bestowed an honorary GED. Okay, so it's kind of difficult... But last week, I quoted me some Greek. I just do that to impress you. But last week, I quoted some Greek. And you know, John Rees has this interlinear Bible that has the English text and then has the Greek right under it. So I'm quoting this Greek, and I think I'm doing a great job. But he realizes I'm I'm making a mistake in, in quoting that Greek. And so he writes me an email. And he sends that email. Where is that email? Here it is, back here. No, I don't have it with me. He writes me an email and says, uh, I made a mistake. So I replied to him, and I was going to read to you and just say, you knucklehead, who who calls you a preacher? But I was going to say, oh, that's my reply to him. No, he wrote me the most complimentary and gentle email, but pointed out a mistake I'd made. And I looked at it, and I said, I don't even know how I made that mistake. I don't know how that happened. I did so much going back from one book to another. Sometimes you get too many books spread out on your desk is what happens. But he he pointed out a mistake. But he could not have been more humble and more gentle in the way he pointed out that mistake. And you know what? It makes me love John even more because I know he loves me. Gentleness. Gentleness is not just understanding how this would make me feel and acting and speaking accordingly, but it's about dignity. It's about being sensitive to the the other person's dignity and showing them the utmost respect. It's in James chapter 1 and verse 21 that James writes and says, Therefore, putting away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness. The New American Standard uses the word humility. The implanted word which is able to save your soul. I don't know why the English Standard Version in this passage translates it meekness. Because that is the same Greek word, here we go again. That is the same word used in Galatians chapter 5 for gentleness. It's having a teachable spirit. See, it's not just about about giving constructive criticism in the right way. It is also about receiving, being taught better with a spirit of gentleness. And humility. Because you know what John could have done last week? He could have stood up, stood up right in the middle of that sermon and said, Preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. He could have done that. But that wouldn't have been very gentle. And it wouldn't be very loving. So he took the gentle approach. And I hope that my response to him was gentle. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. You know these verses well. Brothers... If anyone is caught in a transgression, someone has kind of gone back into sin. We're talking about brothers here. We're talking about Christians. 
who are starting to make the wrong decisions, who aren't living faithful to God, and they're now caught into transgression. I mean, everybody knows it. You, at least you know it, and you know what they're doing. You who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And you probably have heard enough sermons and Bible classes to know that that word translated restore has to do with mending or setting a broken bone or putting back a, a, a dislocated shoulder, putting it back into place to restore what's broken and what's hurting. And in this case, there's a brother or sister in Christ who's dislocated from the membership. Those of you who are spiritual, can I define that for you? Those who are walking by the Spirit who are filled with the fruit of God's Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You go and set that brother in Christ right. Bring them back into the fold. But do it gently. Do it gently. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and thus you fulfill the law of Christ. You and I live in a world where people do not treat each other gently. You see it in politics. You see it on social media. They call names. They use harsh, abrasive words. They use vulgar words because they have to be as mean and harsh and abusive as possible. Whether you're talking about a political opponent or someone on... on um, uh, Social media that you just don't agree with them. You have to put them in their, this is the world talking. You need to put them in, your, in their place. You need to humiliate them. You need to ostracize them. You, you, you just need to treat them so, they need to know you're bigger than they are, meaner than they are. That's the world we live in. But you've been called to walk by the Spirit and to treat other people with gentleness with kit gloves now sometimes especially when you're admonishing someone sometimes you have to be very straightforward not mincing your words but you can still do that with a spirit of, of gentleness and that's not always easy to do because as I said last week, some of those EGRs are in our life. Those people who extra grace is required. Sometimes they're impertinent. Sometimes they're a little bit stubborn. They're kind of difficult to get along with. There are people in our life that just the slightest little thing offends them. And they take a little extra grace and patience and gentleness. But that's what God calls us to be. And we see this in the life of our Savior. It's in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5. The NIV says, Sons of the daughters of Zion, see your king, talking about Jesus, comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. Your king comes to you humbly, gently. And that's the way he treated sinners. That's the way he treated people who needed to turn back and be embraced by God one more. He always treated them gently. He always called them back to God with words of humility. Perhaps you're one of those that God needs to call back this morning. Maybe deep down you know you're not someone God has been able to count on. Maybe you've been sporadic in your attendance. Maybe you've been sporadic in your giving. Maybe you have been too long uninvolved in this church outside of the Sunday morning assembly. And maybe you know you need to turn back to God and be more faithful. Well, what you will find is you're not going to find a God who is harsh and blistering, who is going to be mean towards you. Where have you been and what have you done? You're going to find a God with open arms, full of His grace, and full of His mercy. And maybe you need to make 
a public statement this morning. Maybe you need to come, whether you're online, you can connect with us there, whether you're here in person. Maybe you need to come back to the Lord. Can I make you another promise? If you were to come and and confess some sin in your life or some unfaithfulness, what you're going to find from this church is a room full of people who will be gentle. They will be thrilled that you've come back to the Lord, and they will gently and lovingly welcome you back. Maybe you're looking for a church home, a church full of people who are walking by the Spirit, filled with the fruit of His Spirit. If you're looking for a church home, come see me afterwards. Find me somehow and let me know that. But certainly go online and connect with us and let us know because we'd love for you to be a part of this wonderful church family while together we stand and we sing.